We're going to get into the text of Matthew 1 shortly, but before we do, I want to give you just a little bit of background on Matthew's gospel. The gospel of Matthew is one of three what are called synoptic gospels. The others are Mark and Luke. They're referred to as the synoptic gospels because they share common views on the life of Jesus, but were written to different original audiences. Uh, so that they have a distinct perspective and flavor in how they tell the story of Jesus. Think of how uh, three people who were eyewitnesses to the same event or the same story would tell the story. Would it be exactly the same? No. Three different people could witness the exact same event or events, and they're going to tell the story while factually true and accurate from their perspective, a little bit different than the others. They're going to use their own vocabulary. When they relay the story, they're going to relay the story toward the audience that they're telling it to. So maybe person number one is telling the account of what happened to a small child. Are they going to tell that story the same way they would to a, a master's degree level room of college students, graduate students? Probably not. So factually the same, factually accurate, but directed at different audiences from different perspectives, so they're going to have different flavors and emphasize certain truths about Jesus. All the things that gospel writers write about Jesus are true, but the different writers emphasize different aspects of truth about Jesus. Does that make sense? Uh, the synoptic gospels, Matthew Mark and Luke share much of the same content with 90% of Mark's content included in Matthew. So most of the gospel of Mark is also included in Matthew. Approximately 50% of Mark's content is included in Luke. The gospel of Matthew was written by the apostle Matthew, who had been a tax collector, one of the most beloved professions in Israel. Not... People felt about tax collectors about the way we feel about people from the IRS today, only much, much worse in Israel. So Matthew had been a tax collector before Jesus walked by his tax booth and said, follow me, and Matthew put everything down and followed Jesus as one of his disciples and later apostles. Matthew's gospel is written to a primarily Jewish audience, and his purpose was to highlight the fact that Jesus was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, that he was Israel's Messiah. Consequently, the phrase, quote, that it might be fulfilled, is used repeatedly in Matthew as he builds his case that Jesus is Israel's long-awaited Messiah King. Matthew uses this phrase or similar ones 12 times in his gospel, as well as using the phrase, it is written nine times about Jesus' fulfillment of prophecy. Matthew's gospel builds a compelling case to his original audience and us that Jesus is who he said he is. He did what he said he would do, and he will do all that he has promised yet to do in the future. So you ready to get into Matthew? Yeah. Let's start with Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. And I've got a lot of names to read right here. So have some grace. I got a little tongue-tied when we were sound checking. So here we go. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. David, the king, begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Sol Solomon, not Salmon, Solomon begot Rehoboam. Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat. 
Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham, Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Ammon, and Ammon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel begot Abiud, Abiud begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor. Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Akim, Akim begot Eliud, Eliud begot Eliezer, Eliezer begot Mathan, and Mathan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. That's a lot of names. Oh, thank you. So we start our study tonight with the pulse-pounding excitement of a genealogy. Are you guys excited? If you're like me, you probably skip over most of the genealogies as you come to them in the Bible. Honesty in church, how many of you, when you see those long lists of names, just kind of skip over them and get to the rest of it? Okay, know that you are not alone. There are some of you nerds that get super into it and like study through every single name and who is this guy? And if that's you, I praise God for you and I would love to take advantage of your nerddom and research and find out what you have found out without me having to do all that work myself. So oftentimes we tend to skip over these genealogies, but I'm going to make a case for why we shouldn't just skip over this one. Before we get to some of the names in this genealogy, I believe it's necessary to address a challenge that maybe you have never thought of and maybe you never will think of when it comes to these genealogies. Um, There's a challenge that could cause some people to lose confidence in the reliability of Scripture if they were to examine this challenge without some help. This is a bit of a deep dive into some technical stuff, and I would probably give a very brief summary of this on a Sunday, but you all are here on a Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. That means you guys are the hardcore ones, right? You got your seatbelts buckled, you're ready to go deep in the scriptures, so we're going to go a little bit deeper and more technical than we might normally go on a Sunday as we look into this. So the challenge I'm talking about is the differences between the genealogy given to us here by Matthew and the genealogy that Luke gives for Jesus in Luke chapter 3. Have any of you ever noticed there's some differences between those two genealogies? And has it made you wonder, I wonder what's going on here? Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe it never has and never would cross your mind. You're, thinking, you're sitting here thinking, I have never thought about that. It would never dawn on me to think about that, and that's okay. But some have made the argument that because these genealogies differ, they shouldn't be trusted. Or perhaps a step further, that because these genealogies differ, it's proof that the Bible can't be trusted. My belief, uh, my purpose in addressing this is this, to inoculate you against falling into that doubt. Pastor Lance taught this on Sunday. The belief we always start with when we approach the Bible is that it's inspired by God and without error in its original manuscripts. 2 Timothy 3.16, which Pastor Lance uh, quoted several times on Sunday, tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. I like how the NIV and ESV translate this verse. NIV reads, all scripture is God-breathed. ESV reads, all scripture is breathed out by God. That's actually a better literal translation of the Greek because the, the compound word that is used for inspiration is the word theonoustos. It literally means God-breathed. So, all scripture is breathed out by God. When we start with this belief that God's word is exactly that, God's word. When we start with that belief that it was breathed out by him, inspired by him, sustained by him, kept by him, it guides everything else we do and everything else we believe. 
So that's where we start from. So as we approach the differences in the genealogies and Matthew and Luke, what is off the table is that somehow the Bible writers got it wrong. That's off the table. Or that somehow they disagreed with one another. So what are the options? There's two mainly held beliefs that harmonize the difference between these two genealogies. There's actually multiple, many different theories about that, ideas, but there's two that are kind of the main ones. So uh, before we get to those, let's look at the differences in approach and perspective between these two genealogies. Matthew's genealogy, you notice, begins with who? Abraham. Matthew's genealogy begins with Abraham and works forward from there to Jesus. Remember, Matthew's gospel was originally written to what audience? Jewish audience. And Matthew's goal is to convince his audience that Jesus is their Messiah. Consequently, the genealogy in Matthew begins with the patriarch of the Jewish people, Father Abraham. Did you know that he had many sons? <laughs> many sons had Father Abraham. As a matter of fact, I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Additionally, in verse 1, Matthew also refers to Jesus as the son of David. So in doing this, Matthew connects Jesus to David, from whom the royal line of the Messiah would descend. And Abraham, the one Genesis 12 verse 3 tells us, through whom all families of the earth would be blessed. Luke's genealogy of Jesus from Luke chapter 3 works in reverse order, starting with Jesus and working back to Adam. Luke, being a Gentile believer who was writing to a Gentile audience, wanted to show that Jesus didn't just belong to the Jews, but to all people tracing back to Adam. Isn't that good news for us Gentiles that are here? Most of us are here are Gentiles. We may have a few Jewish brothers and sisters, but most of us here are probably Gentiles, and that's great news for us that Jesus is our Messiah also. Now the problem Aside from beginning and ending in different places, which isn't really a problem, it's just a matter of perspective, Luke and Matthew's genealogies vary after David. They're the same until you get to David, and then they vary from each other. Why is this? Does this mean that the Bible can't be trusted? Y'all should have said no louder than that. Does this mean that the Bible can't be trusted? No, it does not mean that. Of course not. Again, we start with the belief and understanding that the Bible is inspired by God and entirely trustworthy. So there must be some explanation for the differences. So there's two theories, like I mentioned. Uh, neither of these theories is completely without its problems. So I hate to break it to you for those who like to wrap everything up in a nice, neat little bow without any, any questions or wonderings. This is not going to be one of those things. Uh, different scholars disagree on the theories and point out, well, there's this problem with this, this view and there's this problem with this view. The good news is this. We know that Jesus is the Son of God. We know that he was born of a virgin. We know that he is a descendant of Abraham and David and he is the rightful king of Israel as well as the rightful king of the universe. So we know all those things. So none of these Different viewpoints change any of that. The first theory that has been given for the, the differences between Matthew and Luke's genealogies is this. The theory is that Matthew gives the legal line of descent from David, naming who the heir to the throne is in each case. But Luke gives the actual descendants of David in the branch of the family that Joseph belonged to. So oftentimes in establishing legal lineage like for kings, they wouldn't necessarily list all of the descendants. They would just list the ones that had a bearing on the right to the throne, right? And so uh, this theory is that that was the case, that uh, Matthew gives the legal line of descent from David in Joseph's family line, and that... Uh, Luke gives the actual descendants of David 
in the branch of Joseph's family. This theory requires some conjecture, and there really is no way of knowing if the conjecture is accurate or just conjecture. The second theory is this, that Matthew is recording the genealogy of Jesus through the line of his adoptive father, Joseph, uh, to establish his legal lineage as a descendant of David and an heir to David's throne. Remember that the legal lineage passed not through the mother, right? Legal lineage passed through the father. So the rights to a throne passed through the father's line. So Joseph was Jesus' adoptive father. And so this theory would hold that Matthew's genealogy is giving the genealogy of Jesus through Joseph to establish the legal lineage that Jesus would have uh, as Joseph's adopted son, as an heir to the throne of Israel. In this theory, Luke is recording the actual blood lineage of Jesus, but through Mary. This is why the genealogy in Luke 3.23 begins with this. Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. This theory holds that this phrase, as was supposed, is meant to tip us off that the genealogy is really Mary's genealogy and the true bloodline of Jesus as he had no earthly father. There are some exegetical challenges to this view, but it seems to be the most sound view as it harmonizes God's curse upon the line of Jeconiah in Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 30. Jeremiah 22, verse 30, it says, Thus says the Lord, Write this man down as childless, talking about Jeconiah, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Jeconiah, who's also referred to as Coniah or Jehoiachin, so if you've seen any of those names, Jehoiachin, I always remember that because I think of my chin. Uh, this guy was a wicked king in Judah who God cursed and promised he would never have a descendant that would rule on the throne of David. The problem that we encounter is this, that the Messiah was to be a direct descendant of David. The paternal line of succession through David uh, on Joseph's side leads straight through Jeconiah. That's a problem. Is God's word true? Yes, of course it is. So uh, the line through Joseph on Jesus' adoptive father's side leads straight through Jeconiah. Uh, Jeconiah's uncle Zedekiah was the last king of Judah before the exile. If Jesus were a blood descendant of Jeconiah, he would be disqualified as king and Messiah because of God's curse on Jeconiah's line. But God being God, is unhindered by this. Jesus is not a blood descendant of Jeconiah. Why? Because Jesus is not a blood descendant of Joseph. Jesus had no earthly father. Jesus' claim to David's throne came through his mother's line, through David's son, Nathan. So understanding that Matthew's genealogy is through his adoptive father, Joseph, and Luke's genealogy is through his mother, Mary, clears up the problem completely. How good of God to make a way that the natural would be impossible, but with God, it would be possible. Isn't that good news? So we can be confident that God's word is true, and Jesus is the Messiah and the rightful heir of David's throne, both by blood and and by lineage through his adoptive father. Okay, take a deep breath. The rest of the evening should be a little less technical. All right, we good still? We're hanging in there? Nobody's going cross-eyed looking at all those names and everything? You know what I love about this list of names here in the genealogy of Jesus through Joseph? I love that there are some characters in this line. Question for you tonight. Couldn't God have chosen a family line for Jesus of all holy 
godly Jewish people. Could God not have done that? Of course he could have. God could have chosen a completely pure lineage that every single member of the family tree was godly, pure, holy, unquestionably allegiant to Yahweh. God could have done that. He didn't. And I kind of love that he didn't. Woven into the lineage of Jesus is a beautiful redemption story that touches all of us. All of us have some black sheep in our family line. All of us have that uncle or that brother or that cousin or that child. Uh, Not my children. My children are all holy, godly paragons of moral virtue. All of us have some of those members of our family. Maybe we are that person in our family that God has redeemed. Either way, the promise of God is that if he can redeem the family line of Jesus, the Messiah, he can redeem your family line too. If he can bring the Son of God from a broken family line, either by birth in the case of Mary's line or adoption in the case of Joseph's line, he can bring forth his goodness in your family too. Isn't that great news? Verse 2. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah and his brothers, Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar, Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. So we start with Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Three liars. We're not off to a good start. Both Abraham and Isaac lied about their wives being their sisters to protect themselves, potentially at their wife's expense. Liars and cowards. Genesis chapter 20, uh, it tells us this. And Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and stayed in Gerar. Now Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. So Abimelech rose early in the morning, called all his servants, and told all of these things in their hearing, and the men were very much afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? How have I offended you that you've brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. Jump down to verse 10. Uh, Then Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you have in view that you have done this thing? And Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place and they will kill me on account of my wife. But indeed, she is truly my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God called me to want, caused me to wander from my father's house that I said to her, this is your kindness that you should do for me in every place where we go, say of me, he is my brother." When confronted in his lie by Abimelech, Abraham tries to justify it by saying, in essence, well, technically she is my sister, right? Any of you ever have kids that try to pull that when they get caught in a lie? Well, technically, mom, technically, dad, I did tell the truth because... And you're like, nope. Not buying it. Your intention was to deceive. That's the heart of the matter. Well, as often happens in families, this sin pattern was then passed down to Abraham's son and grandson. Don't get me wrong. Abraham was also the father of faith who believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, but he was far from perfect. Jacob's very name was synonymous with being a deceiver and a cheat. How would you like to have the name Deceiver and Cheat? Like, hey, I would love to go into business with you. My name is Deceiver and Cheat. Shall we make a deal? Maybe not so much. 
God dealt with Jacob as well, eventually changing his name to Israel after God wrestled with him. And in the wrestling came a surrender to the will and purpose of God for Jacob's life. Next comes Judah. Oh, Judah. Judah impregnated his daughter-in-law Tamar, thinking he was sleeping with a prostitute. How's that for a double sin whammy? See him try to justify that. Well, I, I didn't mean to do wrong. I, I only thought that I was getting together with a prostitute. Come on, dude. At first, he tried to act self-righteous about it, demanding that she be put to death when he discovered that she was pregnant until. That's until he was outed as the father. You almost expect Maury Povich to pop out from behind the curtain and say, Judah, you are the father. <laughs> we see this in Genesis chapter 38, verse 24. And it came to pass about three months after that Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child by harlotry. So Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. When she was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law saying, By the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, Please determine whose these are, the signet and cord and staff. Guess whose they were? His. So Judah acknowledged them and said, She has been more righteous than I because I did not give her to Sheila, my son. And he never knew her again. Tamar gave birth to twins, one of whom, Perez, was included in Jesus' lineage. We're getting off to a great start, aren't we? This could be like a soap opera. Like, all my children are sand through the hourglass or the days of our lives. Verse 4. Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashon. Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse. In verse 5, we discover more colorful ancestors. We see the name Salmon, not to be confused with the fish. Oh, come on. That was a decent dad joke right there. Did you... Salmon was married to a woman named Rahab. Does that name ring a bell for anyone, Rahab? I'll take prostitutes for 500, Alex. Ding, 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 ding. Joshua chapter 2, it says, Now Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from Acacia, from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. As the story goes, this one-time prostitute protected the spies that Joshua sent out to Jericho, and God saved her entire family, and not just that, he grafted her into the lineage of the Messiah. What a redemption story. Amen. God is a God of redemption. Hallelujah. Maybe you have a story, you need to know God is a God of redemption. He takes people who are caught up in sin and he turns their lives around and makes their lives about a story of redemption and faithfulness from him, not what they did in the past. The child brought forth from the union of Salmon and Rahab would be Boaz, Ruth's kinsman redeemer. We don't have the time tonight to go deeper into that story, but it's a beautiful foreshadowing of Christ who would come later and redeem his people by fulfilling the demands of the law and paying for the price of their redemption, just as Boaz did as Ruth's kinsman redeemer. Verse 6, And Jesse begot David, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab, Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. In addition to Abraham, David is another critical link in Jesus' lineage. 
As you recall, God's promise to David was that his throne would be established forever and consequently, the Messiah would be called the son of David. As we know, David also had his problems, did he not? A fact that is acknowledged right here in the genealogy. In case Matthew's Jewish readers had forgotten, hint, they hadn't, Matthew reminds us that the mother of Solomon, whose name is not mentioned here, but who we know as Bathsheba, had been the wife of Uriah. She was Uriah's wife until David committed adultery with her and had her husband murdered. Many scholars believe that David was not just an adulterer and a murderer, but also a rapist, given the power differential between the king of Israel and a lowly woman. She really did not have the ability not to consent or not consent to the king of Israel, the most powerful man in the world at the time. Regardless of whether it was rape or adultery, it was a terrible sin before God, and yet God continues to forgive and redeem. This leads us to Solomon, a guy who started off good and wise, but didn't finish very well. Just as Father Abraham had many sons, Brother Solomon had many wives and concubines. Many wives had Brother Solomon. And they eventually led him astray. Verse 7, Solomon begot Rehoboam, Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham, Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Ammon, and Ammon begot Josiah. I could go deep into the lives of many of these kings, but suffice it to say they are a mixed bag at best. Rehoboam, the king of Solomon, is the king that was responsible for the ripping of the kingdom of Israel in two, dividing it between Israel and Judah. Remember, he succeeded his king and he had the wise men that said, if you will serve these people, they will follow you forever. And then he went and consulted a few of his buddies and they said, no, you should make it even harder for them. And, and he said, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. You thought you had it bad with him. I'm going to make it 10 times worse. And they said, peace out. We're out. Only the tribes of Benjamin and Judah stayed with Rehoboam. So he was responsible for ripping apart the kingdom. Following Rehoboam were some real baddies and a few somewhat goodies who still had major problems. That is until we get to Josiah. Josiah was extraordinary. If you want a good Bible name to give your son, Josiah is a great one. 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 24, about Josiah, it says, Moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted mediums and spiritists and household gods and idols, all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Now before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor after him did any arise like him. Sounds like a pretty extraordinary guy, doesn't it? Josiah was only eight years old when he became king in Judah. Imagine being out in your backyard playing with your Hot Wheels or your Barbies, and all of a sudden you discover you're the king or you're the queen. I'm out playing with my Hot Wheels in the backyard and all of a sudden, guess what, buddy? You're the king of Judah. The what of what? Despite his young age at the start of his reign, Josiah sought the Lord, purged Judah of all of its idols, repaired and restored the temple and renewed the worship of Yahweh. That's pretty awesome. Unfortunately, 
it didn't last. It lasted as long as Josiah lived, and then after that, it faded really quickly. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried, verse 11, sorry, were carried away to Babylon. Verse 12, after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. I mentioned God's church, uh, God's church, God's curse on Jeconiah and his descendants earlier. Uh, here in this list of defendants, well, I can't talk right now. Sorry, I'm just getting tongue-tied tonight. Here in this list of descendants, not defendants, we're not in a courtroom, <laughs> we find another good guy, Zerubbabel. Say that five times fast. Zerubbabel was born in Babylon during the exile and was one of the leaders who returned to Judah to rebuild the temple, having been appointed as governor of Judah. He succeeded in his work, and although he rebuilt the temple smaller than Solomon's original temple, it actually lasted much, much longer. Uh, it was still standing as the temple in Jerusalem when Jesus the Messiah came into the courts. Zechariah prophesied that Zerubbabel would finish his work of rebuilding the temple in Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah 4, starting in verse 6, it says, So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. And some of you may have memorized this verse. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain. And he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundations of this temple. His hand shall also finish it. And you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. Zerubbabel was a man of faith and diligence who trusted God and fulfilled all that God called him to do. He's a guy that you would be happy to have in your family line. Verse 13. Zerubbabel begot Abiud, Abiud begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor. Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Akim, and Akim begot Eliud. Eliud begot Eliezer, Eliezer begot Mathan, and Mathan begot Jacob. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Beyond Zerubbabel, we don't have any more particularly noteworthy names here to look at until we get to Joseph. When we get to Joseph, do you notice something different? When we get to Joseph, the pattern of the genealogy changes. What word follows every name in the genealogy until we get to Joseph? Begot. Why the change? Because Joseph didn't beget Jesus. Joseph was the adoptive father of Jesus. He didn't beget him. He didn't uh, sire him. Joseph was not the biological father of Jesus. When we get to Joseph, the text says this in verse 16, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Matthew makes it clear in his genealogy, just as Luke does in his, that Joseph was the adoptive father of Jesus and not his father by blood. This is important because if Joseph had been the birth father of Jesus, then the curse of Adam's sin would have passed on to Jesus as well, and he would have been a sinner just like the rest of us. And that wouldn't work. But because Jesus had no earthly father, his father was and is the father. 
Adam's sin was not passed on to Jesus, the second Adam. Consequently, Jesus could be the perfect, sinless Savior who would offer his life as atonement for the sins of the whole world. Just a thought as we close out this section of Matthew and the genealogy. As I mentioned earlier, many of us come with some baggage in our family history. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'll bet most of the hands in the room would go up if I asked you if you had some baggage in your family line. Mine comes with multiple divorces. My mother had siblings by three different women. Uh, Her father was kind of a serial philanderer, and so she had siblings kind of all over the place. Alcoholism and infidelity mark my family's history, and that's just what I know about. But just like me, if you are a believer in Jesus, you have been grafted into a new family. The family of God. Maybe you were the rogue in your family. Maybe you were the troublemaker. Maybe you were the one that had issues that brought shame upon your family. Maybe you were the mark on your family line. But if you're a believer in Jesus, you aren't anymore. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, it says this. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of them you but you were washed you were sanctified you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God I want to encourage you tonight live out of the reality of who you are in Christ establish your family line on that foundation Establish your family line moving forward from you on who you are in Christ as a redeemed person who has been washed, justified, saved, sanctified, and set free by the power of Christ. Can you say amen to that? Verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together... She was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was, reminded, uh, was minded to put her away secretly. Among the Jewish people at the time of Jesus' birth, there was a three-step process to marriage. Pastor Lance taught about this a few weeks back on a Sunday when he taught about the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19. If you haven't heard that teaching, I highly encourage you to give it a listen. It was outstanding. And he sort of breaks down again how the marriage process worked in ancient Israel. The first step in the marriage process was engagement. Because most of the marriages were arranged by the parents of children, oftentimes this engagement happened when the children were very young. Very young people Their life was already planned out for them. And so engagement was the first step in the marriage process. The second step was betrothal. Betrothal was legally binding and the couple would be considered husband and wife even though the wedding had not yet taken place. A divorce was actually required to break a betrothal. You couldn't break a betrothal without a divorce because they were considered husband and wife, even though the wedding hadn't happened yet. This is where we find Mary and Joseph in the betrothal period. The text tells us once again that Mary uh, was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Oh, let me back up a little bit. So we have betrothal. The final step uh, in the marriage process was marriage, which took place after the betrothal and the wedding. This was usually about a year. So the betrothal period was about usually about a year long. And then after the betrothal would be the wedding, which Pastor Lance talk, taught about how they would do all of that, how the, the husband would come to get his bride and how excited she would be and what a beautiful picture that is of Christ in the church. So 
uh, following the betrothal would be the wedding and the marriage, and then they would be completely and officially married. The text tells us once again that Mary was conceived, uh, Mary conceived Jesus by the Holy Spirit. It also tells us something about the character of Joseph. See, before the angelic visit that Joseph is about to receive, how would Joseph and everyone else have thought Mary became pregnant? The good old-fashioned way. So in Joseph's mind right now, Mary had committed adultery and become pregnant by another man. We know, of course, this was not true, and soon so would Joseph. But not knowing yet that Mary's conception was not human but divine, he was still not willing to humiliate her and have her punished. What does that say about Joseph's character? It says that he was a good-hearted, godly man. He was not willing to put her through a scandal and humiliate her. Can you imagine the scandal that this would have brought upon Joseph as well as Mary? Everybody would have been whispering when they walked by. Oh, we know what you guys have been doing. Had Mary truly been unfaithful to him, Joseph never could have gone forward with marrying her. So he planned to divorce her quietly. Verse 20. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Joseph receives an angelic visit in a dream, assuring him that Mary is not an adulteress and that God has a plan to save his people from their sins. Notice how the angel refers to Joseph. Joseph, son of David. As the angel says this and Matthew records it, he is reinforcing Jesus' legal lineage to King David so that he would also be called the son of David. The angel instructed that Mary's child was to be given the name Jesus, which means Yahweh saves or Yahweh is salvation. Believe it or not, the name Jesus was common in this time. Doesn't it seem fitting that a seemingly common child, born to common people, in what seemed like the common way and given a common name, would in reality be anything but common. This common name, Jesus, would become, as Philippians chapter 2 tells us, the name which is above every name. Amen. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Verse 22. So, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. We sang about that tonight. Which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. There's that phrase in verse 22 that Matthew likes to use to remind the Jewish audience that Jesus was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. It says, so all this was done, what? That it might be fulfilled. Matthew is pointing out Jesus' fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. He then goes on to quote the prophecy from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Jesus would be called Emmanuel, God with us. What a miracle of grace that is. God with us, Emmanuel. 
that God would become human and dwell with us. With the assurance the angel gives Joseph, rather than secretly divorcing Mary, he takes her to be his wife. Verse 25. And he did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. This verse closes out the chapter and gives us two more important pieces of information. First, it tells us that Joseph didn't know Mary until she had brought forth her firstborn son. This, of course, is a euphemism, knowing her. It's a euphemism for sexual intercourse. There would be a time that Joseph would know Mary by consummating their marriage, but it wouldn't be until after Jesus was born. Notice the text also refers to Jesus as Mary's firstborn son. So, two things we notice there. It says he didn't know her until, and that Jesus was Mary's firstborn son. What do the terms till or until and firstborn imply? The word until implies that something is going to happen. If I said, I didn't get to work until 9.30 today, am I saying I did or I did not get to work? I got to work. If I said, I did not eat lunch until noon, am I saying that I didn't eat lunch or am I saying I did eat lunch? I did. If I say, I didn't get here this evening until 5.45, what am I saying? I'm saying, I got here at 5.45. So when the text says that Joseph didn't know Mary, that he didn't have sexual relations with her until Jesus had been born, he is saying that Joseph had sexual relations with Mary the way any normal married couple would. What does the term firstborn imply? Right. So if I only have one son, am I going to call him my firstborn son or am I just going to say this is my only son? This is my firstborn son. Oh, how many other sons do you have? Oh, none. I just call him my firstborn. That doesn't make any sense. If there's a firstborn son, what is there? There's a secondborn son, right? So... Both of these things here in just this one verse imply that Mary and Joseph did have a normal marital sexual relationship and that Mary did have other children. This contradicts and denies the Catholic belief in the perpetual virginity of Mary. There is no biblical basis for the belief that Mary remained a virgin after Jesus was born. If you were taught that growing up, I'm sorry you were taught wrong. That's not what the Bible teaches. Amen. That's what Catholic dogma teaches, but that's not what the Bible teaches. The text indicates the opposite. And it finishes with this, and he called his name Jesus. So we see that Joseph was obedient to God's command through the angel in naming his adopted son Jesus, who would save his people from their sins. Isn't that good stuff in Matthew yeah. chapter 1? Aren't you glad we went into the genealogy tonight? You don't have to feel bad about skipping it over in the past, but there was some good stuff in there. 